Hello? Hello, Valentinian. Can you hear me well? I can hear you well. All right, word. I heard you're fresh out of the shower. Well, I knew I had a date with you and Big Dan, so I had to be all <laughs> fresh and clean. <laughs> yeah, a true privilege, a true privilege. I'd like to think that you, uh, you, know, you showered for the, for the occasion, so that's very appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing to do with being home from work. I no, exactly. <laughs> nothing to do with a long day or anything like that. <laughs> so how you feeling, man? You uh, you feeling chess ready? Not at all. But I'm ready to go. I solid. I haven't caught many of these because I've actually have been at work for most of them. But from what I have looked at, it doesn't look like they took the beginning time to like evaluate the position. I want to try and do that first because, like, when you start a game, you got a game plan and you kind of go forward. But now you're just giving us like a game plan and you got to go from there. So, like, you haven't looked at all the possibilities right away. If that makes sense. You mean like as soon as the position gets slapped in front of you to right to make sure they, they just do make... like an overall evaluation. Right. Exactly. I'm gonna take a few seconds and try and maybe use that to my advantage. Uh huh. Okay. I like it. You're coming in. Looking to maybe do something a little different compared to uh, compared to other people. Correct. Okay. Okay. I like it. All right. Night attacks. Um. 92 looks like the immediate reply because it hits the hits the pawn here. Knight b1 would not be a, a very bad move, but knight e2 um, hitting the pawn and maybe intending to reroute to g3 looks good. There's also, because we're kind of in some building habits, quote unquote theory here, there is some idea that after knight e2, he's going to have a hard time defending that pawn. So we'll see what he's planning after that, but it might be already looking to win a pawn here. Okay, we, we expect this one. It's the main way to defend this pawn. And when I say win a pawn, I'm going to play the move c3 right now and make an offer to my opponent. If he wants to take, we can take back, no problem. I actually have a bunch of different ways to do so, but you know, knight takes, for example, d4 afterwards. If he doesn't take and he keeps defending it, that's where you could run into issues and maybe lose a pawn. So I'm going to start with c3 and break up uh, his pawns in the middle. He might be very tempted by d3, but then he's going to lose a pawn for sure. Okay, knight c6. Again, very logical defending the center. Um, something like takes takes is what I expect. And then I'm going to unleash the move most likely queen a4. This is something that we talked about in the habit series, and it's the main reason why it's black in the Karakhan. If your opponent is playing d4, they could walk right into this. So let's see how it progresses here. Okay, I'm going to follow up with uh, what I've been outlining. Queen a4 hits the pawn and also pins the knight. d3 makes a lot of sense. This is going to be the same reaction uh, as if he had played d3 last turn. So knight f4 is certainly possible simply to take it back. Um, the move knight d4, though, intending to take the knight and also allow the bishop to take on d3. Certainly possible. So I think we just have a nice, um, nice choice here. Knight d4, bishop d7, bishop takes on d3. And then the other one being knight f4 and looking to take on d3 next. So both of them look good. I'm going to choose knight d4. Okay, good move. 
Um, you know, he wants to take back if I capture, but I'm going to play bishop takes d3. This is the free pawn that I was hinting about a couple moves ago. Okay, knight takes. It's got to be with the queen because the queen's under attack, so nice, easy move for me there. Knight f6. Makes a lot of sense. Um... The move e5, very tempting here. Anytime you see your opponent's knights um, and you're able to pressure them with d5 or e5 and they can't move into the center, then you're really, you're really considering um, attacking them. So I'm going to go e5 and see how he reacts. Knight h5. Knight on the side of the board. You guys know that's not usually a good thing. I'm probably going to immediately put some pressure on it with g4. I like the attempt here. I was wondering if maybe he was going to go for something like this. Um, I am going to take because I can take again on h5 after. But I like I like his energy here with the sacrifice. He does get my bishop. He loses another piece in the process, but I wouldn't say this position is over. Not yet. Nice move. We got to move this queen here. I'm going to try to stay guarding my knight. And queen a4 check is also a consideration, let's say. Ooh, Valentinian trading queens. I'm going to accept that every day of the week. I think that's a, a big blunder. Um, let's try to take on f7 here. Bishop e3 and rook out to c1 looks decent as well. Let's try to develop with tempo. And knight can, let's say, return. Ooh, maybe he would have taken my pawn, I thought. Bring the knight back into civilization here. Some nice quick moves from Valentinian. I, I like it. I like it. We're trying to get his, uh, his rook nice and trapped in here. And we're succeeding. We're succeeding. His rook didn't have anywhere to go. Let's do more trades. You know, trades are good when you're up material. This guy is protected. And hey, I've got <laughs> a number of extra pieces as well. Let's protect that. I'm greedy. I'm greedy. Okay, I'm going to take here. And I'm just sort of vacuuming up all the pawns here, one by one. Yeah, even at the expense of my knight, I think we want to just take all these pawns. Okay, let's take that. And time for a queen. The last thing to be careful of is just stalemate. So as long as there's, as long as there's none of that, we'll be okay. Let's force the king onto the side of the board, and then go for a nice checkmate like that. Go for a nice checkmate like that. All right. So again, before we start getting into it, I'm just gonna do a quick uh, rematch. We're just gonna play the same position, switch colors, and then and then we'll talk about it. So, um, Val went for this move. We've seen all sorts of moves from this position. Bishop uh, g4 being one of the main ones, certainly. Pawn takes being another one. I'm going to go for bishop g4 followed by e6. I think it's solid. Okay, I like the, uh, the move. I'm probably just going to go e6. Nice and, uh, nice and chill. Knight f6 next, he's attacking. I think bishop f3 here is, uh, is just fine. Black usually wants to get the bishop out, get this nice structure, and then they don't really care. Bishop h5 is a good move as well, but I'm going to go for bishop takes and then getting my pieces out like that. Love this move instead of just d3. I think this is a great move. I am I'm tempted to go here, but... The first thing I'm going to do is bishop e7 on the way to castling. If he decides to go here, which is tempting, especially, I would say it's way more tempting the lower rated you are to just attack your opponent's pieces. Then I'm going to slide my knight back, play c5 and knight c6, and put a lot of pressure on the center. 
if he doesn't go here, then I'm probably going to take it next turn. So we'll see what he, what he does against this. So this is obviously exactly what I expected. Um, the interesting thing is that, you know, hey, if I wasn't playing pawn takes here, and I wasn't playing pawn takes here, why would I play pawn takes on the next turn? So as white, I would say castling makes a lot more sense. e5 can still be a great move, but he's going to have to back it up correctly. And it's very easy to underestimate c5, knight, c6. For example, I'm going to play knight here, and I think white should move the knight back and play c3, but that's definitely not the easiest plan to, to realize. So he castles very quickly. I'm going to quickly attack the center. Okay, and things are, things are really playing out in a very um, expected fashion. So here I have the option to take and go knight c6, or I can just start with knight c6. Um, both, look, both look pretty decent. I would maybe say that um, knight c6 first, <laughs> maybe slightly better. I don't know, it's very... Uh, it's like a minute detail. A minute detail. Kind of tough to say. Um, I think knight c6 allows for more tactics in the position, but pawn takes here is just a safer, cleaner advantage. I remember playing another games in this building plan series where I took, so I think I'm going to go knight c6 instead. It okay, goes a3. It's definitely not uh, a top-tier move. I'm going to look to take one or both of these pawns. Um, so I'm probably going to start like this. And we can see we can see the plan coming to fruition is that I basically get to, uh, to win this center pawn after, after all that. OK, no choice but to take, of course. He goes back, and now we're just up one pawn, so let's get castled to safety. And where are my pieces going to go in this position? Bishop, great on f6, makes an immediate threat to win the game. Also a nice diagonal. Okay, I like the move queen f4 from uh, my opponent here. Let's get the rook to the only open file that I have. So. Easy choice. I like the move. I'm probably going to go here. Again, open file connects my rooks. And although this is not a threat, I'm definitely staring at an undefended queen. So there could be some tactics here. Um, I wouldn't really call this one like a completely winning tactic, but it definitely looks like a nice move. Um, he certainly could not notice the queen hanging, and he certainly doesn't. Go ahead and take that one. And not the first free queen that I've actually taken from a very similar position to this um, during this series. But if he traded queens with me, I would have taken back. And then taken here, I would have won a pawn. And then I would be up two pawns going into the end game. Let's go ahead and just simplify. Double up the rooks. And something like rook to c1, for me, is the absolute simplest because it, um, it looks to just trade all the pieces. Yeah, so I just want to go rook here next. Force a trade, bring the other rook down there, do it again. Yeah, takes. And here I'll probably go queen f3, a little bit more accurate. Planning to go rook to c1 after rook e3. And here I don't really have a uh, checkmate there on c1 anymore, but that is checkmate. And it is pretty unstoppable. Should be made in one. And although here it stops that made in one, it does allow this made in one. GG's Valentinian, which means we can uh, jump into a quick analysis here. And I'm just going to get back in the call with him. Hello, sir. Hey, how you doing, Amon? How do you feel after those? Um, honestly, I thought I played pretty well the first game. Just the time pressure got to me, so I had to play quicker. And then the second one, I had a pretty good time, uh, like, was able to keep up on time. But then 
you know, I just hung a piece not thinking about too much stuff. So, you know, I think overall the gameplay was supposed to be well, and then I just failed, crumbled. Hey, crumbling is a, you know, it's nearly expected when when you're facing someone, you know, more than double your rating. So uh, for, for that to happen, it's not, let's say it's not the most surprising, but the, the first game, I certainly agree, was um, a lot better than, than the second one. You looked a lot more comfortable in the first game. Really? I honestly thought I played the second one better than the first one. But So the, get... the first one, the reason that, although it was kind of quicker and you ended up hanging a piece, the the way you were playing was as if you had was as if you were a guy with a plan now it might have been a bad plan but but it looked like all your moves were like you know they look well reasoned um so i i'm sure we're about to hear more about them um but the uh the second one although you maybe like uh the position looked a bit better like you sort of had the center you got castle like all these good things happened um the second game actually crumbled a lot um a lot quicker than than the first game it's just sort of gradual the first game was like big blunder right drop the knight on the side of the board drop the full right. piece well, yeah i mean I, if we're gonna go over it i'll go over it then yep. um, um yeah. so i'm just gonna share my screen in discord make it a little easier for you to see exactly um uh what i'm looking at And yeah, let's take a look. But yeah, I, I threw a Karakana at you, so I'm not sure how you... What kind of experience do you have with that opening? Is this something that you see at all or see with either color more than the other? Come on, all I know is Queen's Gambit. I know five lines. So safe to say not with white? <laughs> Neither, dude. No, I don't know nothing, dude. <laughs> I mean, I know the name. I I know the name. I know people like recommend it, but I never play. Oh, it. you know the name. Okay, well then, it's basically like knowing the opening. <laughs> you know. All right, here we go. So you can see the uh, the board oh, yeah. here. Yeah, I see you now. So this was you with the uh, with the black pieces. You came yes. in with. Uh, D4, and this is why I was saying it looked like you were a guy with a well-reasoned plan. Like, I don't know what your initial view of the, you said you were going to maybe take stock at the beginning, sort of think overall what your plan was, but uh, your next couple moves, clearly you you had some plan in mind that you were going to attack this knight, gain a bit of space, and then just try to protect that pawn for the rest of the game. Yeah, well, so I lost like 10 seconds because I don't know it was my move first. I was waiting for you to move. <laughs> um <laughs> But after I realized that my clock was ticking down, I looked at, you know, I, I've definitely seen this before, like the like visual, but I don't know what to do here. So like I could either attack the knight, make him move the knight, mm -hmm. and then like, but I'm overextending myself, right? So my other way I looked at was, okay, I moved the bishop out, and that's what you end up doing against me is pinning the, the knight to the, the queen. Right. Um, but I ended up being, trying to be greedy and take space. Right. That's fair. That's sort of what I thought you might think. Um, so you support this bond. Now, in the Habit series, this is something that uh, I even went over because I was concerned about telling people, hey, you know, play this opening, this is good. Because even if this isn't the best move in the position, I think that it's probably going to be one of the most common. People are always going to look to, you know, push a pawn and attack a piece. That's just normal. Um, and so this is a move and a series of moves, the next ones that I played that I recommended from the Habit series. So I actually got a chance to use them right here. And um, this position, if you um, look at an engine or something, basically Black's going to end up losing this pawn in all the lines, unfortunately. So right. the main way to defend it is like pawn here, but that's why the pin is so important. I can just take that. See, this was strategic. It was to build both building plans and building habits into one. <laughs> exactly. I thought, you know what, that Valentinian guy, he only knows D4 and barely. So we'll throw him a, a, a Karo Khan and he's going to demonstrate everything perfectly. Perfect. Uh, and otherwise, I'm attacking your pawn. How, how are you supposed to defend it if not like this? Well, you came up with the only solution, which is basically to push it, right? I mean, yeah. there's, there's nothing else. And here the trick is like, I, I threaten your knight while also uncovering an attack on the yeah, pawn. Yeah, I, I realized I was done here. Yeah, done is in like, yeah, you're going to lose that pawn, but definitely not done overall. 
like not not lost or anything like that. So this is absolutely a you know great move. You're you're lining up the queen to uh, you're lining up your bishop to the queen rather. And uh, I think here you could have maybe started with knight there. I don't mind this move at all. So knight takes d4, queen d4. This looks fine. So and I was scared because then you could push your e pawn attacking that, and I didn't know where I would go with that afterwards. And I think I ended up doing that, or maybe last game, but I like ended up losing my knight. You did. You did it anyway. So the thing is, when you bring your knight out, and I was mentioning this while I was speaking, it's like if either of your knights can ever be attacked by a pawn, either one. So like. This knight here, pawn there attacks it. If you can't go into like a central square as a result, then you should probably reevaluate the move itself. Right, there's, there's but I not could go to often... d5 and it would be fine. Yeah, here you could. Uh, but like the way you played it when you went here, after e5, you can't. Right. So because you can't so... use those squares, it's not like it's always bad to do it, but I would always give it a second thought. I would always give it another consideration. It's like, okay, I obviously want my knight there, but if I can't go here, here, then I should start calculating, you know, am I really comfortable with my knight on the other alternatives? There's no d7. You know, if you go to g4, I'm just going to attack you. You got to go here. You know, that's not a great square. And you know, overall, that knights on the side of the board are just not great squares, period. Right. So that would make me sort of reevaluate knight f6. And then maybe instead, you go like, I don't know, pawn here. And you think, okay, now if I go here and this happens, hey, I've got the support now for that square. Gotcha. That makes sense. So anytime that you think about moving either one of your knights in the middle, and there's a possibility for your opponent to move a pawn up and attack it, first check if there's a central square available. If there is, then that's always a good sign. Because uh, that's, you know, nine times out of ten going to be the best place to move it. If there isn't, then make sure to calculate the other squares you might have to move to as a result. And hey, are those acceptable for me? And if none of those look any good to you, then you should go back and reevaluate whether you should bring your knight out that early or not. Yeah, it makes sense. Kind of like a little checklist. Um, no, so that's, here, that's great. Here you run into it. Uh, you end up having to, or you know, seemingly you think you have to put your knight on the side. And obviously, bad things happen when knights are on the side. <laughs> <laughs> bad things happen. The guy's got nowhere to go. Um, I give you a little credit here. I like, I like your idea with this because... You're hitting my bishop, but unfortunately, I'm winning two pieces, and you're only winning one. Yeah. So I like you know, I do I like your idea there. It, but what's nice, even maybe there is like lower rated. Like this, is what sucks, but maybe they might miss that, or you know, what I mean, like, yeah, I don't know. There's potential for mess ups. Certainly, they might do a number of different moves here. Absolutely. And then also, my queen's pretty uh, infiltrated on you. And then like my next idea is getting the rook over, and like I. I you know, well, yeah, no, I, I thought you have a lot of options here, which is why I was so disappointed to see this move, trading queens with me. I was scared in no time. <laughs> I couldn't think. <laughs> you, uh, well, I'm pretty sure. We'd have to go back to double check, but I'm pretty sure you had time. I had no time. Well, okay, five seconds for you and five seconds for me is completely different. Let's be fair. Like, uh, I'm panicking. It takes me five seconds to make a, a pre-move here. Okay, I'm... <laughs> I'm gonna have to gonna have to inspect that. I had more than five seconds. I know that, but I'm just saying, like you, you guys know how to deal with time pressure so well. I'm gonna have to inspect that. I thought it was more than that. All right. Well, I hope now. I hope I'm not wrong. <laughs> Damn. I was, I was I was dying there. about it. I was dying, dude. Damn. Okay. <laughs> it's acceptable. <laughs> so just to be fair, but yeah, so that's why I just didn't do it. I just did it because that just made <laughs> it was just natural. <laughs> all right, all right. Now he's off the hook. Six seconds. All right, all right. <laughs> Twenty-two. That counts. Certainly counts. Um, the uh, let me bring that back up again. Where was I? Um. Here we are. Yeah, so I, I mean, this is definitely, basically, you just never want uh, to have to trade queens when you're down material because, you're, as you said, your queen is so infiltrated. This is sick. Like, my bishop can't move. I'm, like, stuck here. I've got my queen that needs to defend my knight. So I figured, like, if you just even develop a castle, you, you absolutely have some, uh, some plans here, like, uh, to put yeah. together. Like, really, I, I know white's better here. I'm up a piece, but 
I think black still can be very, very tricky here. White's king can't really like castle the direction. Bishop's trapped. Queen's stuck defending. I don't have a great looking position. I can still, you know, uncoil here and get out of it, but it's gonna, I have to be precise as well. Now you're just making me sad, but all right, it's all right. <laughs> well, you are down a piece at the end of the day. It's not like you have a winning position, but I just mean you have more potential than you probably gave yourself credit for. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. That's fair. Um, second game, which I want to take a look at, was this one, and I'll just flip it here. So yeah, you had the white pieces in this one, as you said. I went for the bishop g4 move, and I like bishop e2. That's fine. Get out of the pin, and then ask me what I'm up to with h3. This is normal. Hey, get the bishop pair. Love d4, taking the center. Um, and you know that if I... I felt really comfortable there. You know that if I'm uh, attacking you with my pawn here and with my knight, that you've got it covered with your knight and your bishop, right? Yeah, no, I did. And then, so, like, that's why I, I, my idea was, <clears throat> like, I wasn't afraid yet that you were attacking that. So I just want to take this, you know, maybe attack your knight, see what your knight was up to. And then I feel like... You know, if you haven't took it already, then your plan is that you want me attack to open up the middle. So I was trying, like, I was a little nervous. So I right. was like, my plan is to take control of the center so you can't open it up. And then you just made me collapse. <laughs> but I think, I think what you just said is absolutely true, but you went against that. <laughs> so you're saying it now, yeah. and it's correct, but you kind of went against it in the game. Is that if I'm not taking it now, I'm probably not planning to take it. Or if I do, it's clearly not like a, a winning move, or it's not, it's not a big deal. Right. So I played knight here, and you had the option to attack my knight, but you didn't, and you played pawn here, which I was like, oh, this is a great move. And I was going to take your pawn, and then I thought, oh, I'll play bishop e7. I said this out loud. I was like, he's probably now going to play e5, and then I'm going to bring my knight here, play pawn here, knight here, and his whole center is going to fall apart, and that's basically what happened. Right, but I didn't see that, like, I don't see the seven moves ahead, right? So, like, in my head, I was like, hell yeah, I got a good center, we're golden, we're going to crush, and then three moves later... No center, completely wide open. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but you have a few things in your position that can tell you or you can use to restrain yourself from playing this. Like, remember that when you attack something like h3, the reason h3 attacking my bishop is a good move is because if you ask yourself in your position, like, is h3 a useful move for you? The answer is always yes. Or most of the time it's yes. So just because you attack something doesn't mean it's good for you. It's you attack something, but you're also doing something useful for yourself. Here, e5 attacks me, but it's not clear that e5 is useful. Why would it not be useful? Well, you're closing the entire center, and you're the guy that has two bishops. You're going to benefit from a wide open position. So you have two right. bishops. You don't want to close the middle. You want to leave this here and wait for me to take you so that, you know, let's say something like this happens. Both bishops are, are super happy here. You know, that's what I was hoping that you would do. But... Right, and I didn't, I didn't do it. I played here, but then... You know, how come you don't just leave the, the tension? Because you know you're, you've got it covered. You can castle here. You know I'm not threatening this, or I would have done it the last two moves. If I'm just doing this and castling, you can do the same thing. Keep your bishops happier. Right. Keep the position open. See, I even said, like, I, I was like, okay, he didn't take me, so I'm just going to take the center, and then I was like, I'm going to castle no matter what. And I think he made a move, like, I don't know, I was like, unless you're hanging this piece, I'm going to castle. Like, that was my main, like focus in this game yeah you went here i went back castle. and then you castle yeah mm -hmm. so like, I, don't know, I was just trying to put i don't know i thought it was a solid like position where i have you closed off and now i'm in safety and like yeah i didn't think about the you know the bishops you know needing the wide open diagonals right so yep. i didn't look that far in advance it's usually a good guideline that you know as soon as the trade happens of any piece that you sort of re reflect on what that is so if I give you a bishop and, and you get a bishop, all of a sudden you have two bishops against my bishop knight, then you can just sort of generally tell yourself, you don't really want to close things up if you can avoid it. Sometimes it's always, you know, it might be a great move to do this. If my bishop's here, hey, you're winning a piece, obviously do that. But if you're just going here just to attack, you know the guy's going to move his knight and you have to be asking yourself, are you happy with the position after that? Because after that, um, it's really, really common in the Karo Khan uh, because I've actually had another building plans episode with someone else who did the exact same thing to for white to like overextend with these two pawns. But the main part of the Karo Khan for white is your knights on this square. So the big difference is you can't play your pawn up to support this guy. And if I went here and if you could play that pawn up and take take, that would be so much more solid for you. You have pawns defending pawns. Everything's protected. Right. 
So the, the tricky thing about the Karo Khan is everybody loves to push pawns in the center, but nobody realizes that you need other pawns to support them. And if you don't have them there, they're going to undermine it. And then suddenly the whole thing's going to disappear as quickly as it, as it uh, emerged. And I, I don't know, I think I made some other move, which I think I just got my bishop up yet, yeah, but would knight, actually knight e2 be better here? So the fact that you're, the fact that you're saying knight e2 is a very good sign. Knight e2, I'm going to take, if you take with a knight, you lose a pawn. If you take with the queen, I go knight here and you lose the pawn again. Both my right. knights uh, hit it. So no knight e2 is not good here, but knight e2 would have been an absolutely fantastic move here even before right. castling. And then you could even play this pawn up. Yeah, well, that's what made me think of it. Yep. Which I actually did say that, I think, uh, afterwards, but it was like two moves, and I was like, man, maybe I should have had 92 here. So it's like yep. the same, that's the right what's instinct. going on here. Yeah, it's just, uh, you see it after, you know what I mean? After it happens. Yeah, and of course, it's like after you see my whole plan coming into action, you're like, ah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> would have been a little nicer if I had that pawn there. <laughs> exactly. So those are those are some key plans for sure. Like if you're ever gonna expand in the center, you wanna make sure you can back it up with C three or C the move C five is just gonna kill you ten times out of ten. Black always wins these positions where he just annihilates your center. His is so solid in the meantime. Right. Okay, in this move, I, I can't really say too much here. It's not a great move. I would prefer moves that, you know, sort of have to do with the center a little bit more. Queen up, connect the rooks, rooks to the middle. Um, it's not great, so it sort of gives me time to just win this pawn here. If you had brought your rook to the middle like this, then I couldn't necessarily just win that, right? Right. So I, the, the idea behind that was just stop your knight from coming in. I don't know. I was just like, oh, maybe he's just trying to get his knight infiltrated and then get up on like a closer square. Mm -hmm. I also had ideas of trying to maybe get my knight eventually on d6. Like, yeah, that's not crazy at all. So like, <clears throat> I don't know, just stuff like that was like what was going through my head. Um, and I, you know, I was like, we're just trying to develop pieces. And I, I think I like clean up and I got like one rook in, but you already collapsed my center. And it was just right. downhill. And then I hung my queen, so. Yeah, and here you save the bishop, very reasonable. Queen of the middle, always going to be a little bit risky, especially because it's a square where my knight and my bishop can both like attack you in one move. So a little bit risky. I guess queen here would be the more solid, sort of safer move. But as you said, like, once your once your whole center disappears, it's gonna be a really really tough time. And yeah, we hung the queen here, obviously. But if you had taken, it's not like this would be much better because you know now I'm up two pawns. I've got the only open file on the board, and obviously, particularly against me, they're gonna die a very slow, painful death here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I I don't know. I just uh, my heart of hanging a queen. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> drop that one. But uh, yeah, it, th this this game should hopefully. There's definitely a lot of things to learn about how to keep the center. Like as soon as you get a position like this, you have to know that this is the target for me for the next couple moves. I'm gonna play this, this queen there. I'm gonna like everything to attack this pawn because as soon as you move it or take me, then this pawn becomes weak, and then that's the it's new the target. It's the weakness in my uh, position. Yeah, it's not necessarily a weakness, but it's the weakness in this pawn chain. So it's the it's the furthest pawn back. So I have to attack this pawn before I can attack this pawn. I can't just attack this pawn with all my pieces because it's defended. So I have to attack this pawn, and once I deal with that, then this pawn on e5 is suddenly weak. Which means that if you add another pawn to support it, well, look how far I have to go back to attack all these pawns. I have to literally attack that guy. <laughs> and it's so hard to get to that guy. Right. So if you make the base of your, the same thing for you, like you're attacking this pawn, but who cares? That's so well defended. What do you actually have to do? You have to attack like this pawn or this pawn in order to make this one weak. You know, if this pawn dies, then this pawn becomes weak. If this pawn dies, then maybe that one becomes weak. So you, you attack the base of the pawn chain all the time, which is this one. But you can make the base of your pawn chain longer by doing this knight maneuver followed by, uh, followed by c3. That's why that's so yeah. strong. That makes complete sense. So yeah, if you're gonna expand in the center, you gotta know how to how to keep the center intact because that's a very very tough thing to manage, um, especially at your rating. Like all you want to do is just send it castle. But if someone knows a thing or two about how to exploit a center, they're really gonna collapse it in a couple moves every time. Um, so that's why I was saying, hey, just don't even don't even do that. If you do it, hopefully you know how to maintain it from now on. But don't even bother. Just keep things keep the tension. 
right, right? yeah just no, leave it there sure. develop your pieces around it and you know that you're always got this this guy protected on e4 no worries i can't add any more pressure to it either and none of my pieces can attack it so eventually i'm gonna have to take you right yeah and if i Not go like this gotcha. and try to attack your center this is where you should say all right you know, not even going to calculate here. Just like take twice and look how open all your pieces are now. It's a perfect position for the bishops. So I yeah, can't, I'm I can't attack I'm your scared center. Here. You're scared here. Yeah, I am scared here. Well, I'm not so scared. I'm lost here. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I just, I don't know. when you're playing a GM, like it's just I don't know, personally, like I feel like since it's so wide open, like it's better for you because you just have, I don't know, I, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but it's just like, I feel like you're well, I know waiting what you're saying. Be I know what you're saying for sure, but it's the exact opposite. The, a closed position is always going to benefit a stronger player because they're going to be able to maneuver a lot better than you. They're going to be able to understand where the pieces should go. In a closed position, you don't have tactics. Like in an open position like this, there's a much higher chance that you're going to beat me because first of all, I'm probably just worse here. But second of all, you have the, the bishops, there's tactics flying everywhere. I'm more likely to blunder in a tactical position against a lower rated player than a than a positional, slow, grindy, closed position. Because there's just no tactics. There's no room for me to blunder in a closed position. So your your chances will always be like a hundred times higher in a tactical position against the GM. Right. Yeah. I know it might feel the opposite, but in case you're curious about the actual answer, <laughs> the the answer is that you have a much better chance of winning. We've in a talked about position. it many times. I just, I, I don't know. It's crazy. I'm surprised you didn't do a King's Indian game against our uh, setup. A King King's Indian setup in this, in this like, game. Yeah, yeah. For the well, no, like in the building habits, like you gave me the Caro I was surprised you didn't do King's Indian. Oh well, the the King's Indian is like first of all in the habits I play e4 as white, right? So, you know, you could sort of do King's Indian, but not really. Um, as black, like it's more of a d4 opening. Um, you can try to set up like a Pierce defense, but it's a little bit different. And then the other <laughs> thing is the likelihood or the amount of people at those readings I, I'm trying to teach people those openings for that actually play their bishop to g7 or Fianchetto systems is super rare. Like against e4, right. everyone's just going to play e5 or Sicilian. So it's just not worth to spend a lot of time teaching something that's going to happen a low percentage of the time. No, that's fair. I was more saying like you're gonna test me of trading off the dark squared bishops, but I see what you're saying though. For the series, it's not as productive. Right, but also remember, uh, buddy, we have another game to play. Ah, uh, that's fair. <laughs> but you just ruined it because you said you weren't. It's not productive for your series. Well, maybe I said God. that because you were on to me and you put me on the spot. <laughs> well, I know not to trade off the dark squared bishops, just so. I'm ready. Well, then, screw it. There's nothing else to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. So I do have a, a, another one for you, which we'll get set up for, and I'll jump out of this, or I'll mute myself here once again and, and leave, you, uh, leave you to chat. We'll play two more games, so we're going to get a new position and play from white to black, and we'll jump back in, talk about it just like this. So when you say leave me to chat, do you actually want me to entertain chat here? Oh, no, I just mean, like, Okay. <laughs> it's. I just mean like I'm dipping out of the call, but you shouldn't feel even though you're going to be the only one talking here. Like you shouldn't speak. Like I just mean you know keep keep chatting about you know the game or whatever. But yeah, I'm going to set things up for a minute or two here. So feel free to entertain the chat. All right. Does anyone? <laughs> well, I gotta look up the the hockey game here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. That's a good job. That's a good job. All right. So Anyways, good luck, buddy. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we are in a pretty classic e45 position. And again, in this plan series, um, a lot of positions might be repetitive. Uh, it's very much on purpose. I'm trying to see how different people are going to handle the same position. So I think when you're able to compare directly, like the exact same position, how do different ratings think about it differently? Um, that's when you see, kind of shows you the light a little bit. So uh, we see Castle here from Black. Definitely going to pin this knight here and see how he handles it. The bishop's already out. 
So I'm expecting something like d6, and then we could really take advantage of it with knight d5. h6, uh, a brilliant habit soldier. We will always keep the pin, though, so bishop h4 should be very expected. Okay, here comes d6, and I think you guys know what I'm going to do, but this is like basically the low elo killer. This is what I spent a lot of time in my habit series, trying to make sure you guys do to your opponents, but don't have done to you. And uh, once again, I'm going to play knight d5 and try to take advantage of the, uh, um, the pin here that I've got. Okay, the move g5. Um, again, there's always a thought about whether knight takes g5 is good. For example, if he takes back and I go bishop g5, the game's over. It's just winning. But after knight takes g5, knight takes d5 can be played, and it's a whole mess after that. There was another game I played where I played the knight sack. Um, here, I'm just going to go bishop back to g3, and we're going to see basically how this structure does in the middle game. Because it's not a good structure for black, and we're going to see if we can see why. Okay. Captures in the middle. We're going to take with the bishop. We don't want to double our pawns. It also blocks our bishop, so that's an easy one. It's going for a similar thing. He's got the, the pin. The nice thing for me, though, is that I've got c3 to permanently keep his knight out of d4 so that the thing that I was doing to him doesn't happen to me as well. Um, h3, though, just to see where that bishop goes, always a consideration. In this particular case, the move h4, because he's got this, might really open up the h file, and that, that could be pretty dangerous for him. So I'm probably going to go for the move h4, but first I'm going to go c3 and stop his knight from getting in here. He's attacked my bishop. We absolutely don't want to let him take it, so we are going to save that guy and go back. All right, I mentioned that h4 was probably going to be my consideration to open up the h-file, so I'm going to stick with my guns here and go for that. Wow, he nearly pre-moved that move. That's, that's an incredible pre-move. Knight to g6. Okay, well, we're going to take to start. Obviously, want to open up the h file. Okay, and um, it looks like the knight wants to slip into f4 here. d4 is a consideration for me, um, but I'm probably more interested in getting castled and using the h file. So I think I'm pretty attracted to queen d2 at the moment. The other move would be d4, but I don't really want to allow this check. So I'm going to go queen d2. So just going to take this one back. He's doubling our pawns here. Do not underestimate this. Okay, let's get castled um, because we know we want to bring our rook over here d4 to open up the center, but this bishop is going to be a killer. Nice move. I'm a fan of it. Let's play the d4 move. I like king g7 from him, getting out of this pin. It's a really good move. Let's see if he wants to take. Um, I think basically getting that pawn off the... Uh, the knight there is probably not a good thing for him. <laughs> Very bad thing for him, I will say. Maybe he thought he had bishop takes d4, some trick here, but it shouldn't work. Now I think we can take this. And instead of giving a check and letting him run away, I'm probably going to take with my queen. And oh, he's not even going to take it. Oh, this can't be good. This can't be good. Now you guys know we're going to be able to sacrifice here. And that should be GG. He's not even going to take it back. It's game over. But it doesn't mean that I think he blundered because um, I think if he took it, it was also lost. Um, let's give a check with the queen. And then I think if all the rooks get involved here, <laughs> it has to be too much. It has to be too much. 
Yeah, this is going to be the last and final check. And that is, uh, I guess that's kind of what happens when you play g5. You have to expect to be attacked, and, you know, the, the files against your king are going to be utilized. However, uh, before we get too much into it, like I said, uh, we're going to get a rematch in. Here we go. So, you've seen the position before. Um, I just outlined how, you know, castling I don't think is ideal because this pin is quite strong. If you're going to play h6 and g5, you want to do so before you castle. Otherwise, the best way, the most natural way to handle a position like this, play h6 first. Don't even allow this. Okay, solid stuff. Uh, d6, strengthening the center, opening up my pieces, getting ready to castle. Okay, and much like the last game, um, you probably won't be surprised uh, to see me play bishop g4. This is, you know, it might seem repetitive, or it might seem like I'm setting people up for failure, keep giving them these positions, keep playing the same way, but I'm going to keep drilling it in your head. This is the number one way that people lose in symmetrical e45 positions. It doesn't matter if you're white or black, but if you're like under 1300, this is like number one way people get bad positions. Okay, bishop b3. I like it a lot more than, uh, than last game. He's challenging me on this square. I am going to probably play um, knight to d4 because I'm interested in at least getting the bishop pair. So knight d4 and utilizing this pin once again. Nice move. Um, I am going to take with the bishop. Much like last time, I don't ever see the advantage in playing pawn takes because it blocks my bishop and it doubles my pawns in the middle. And he can't take it back immediately because of the pin. Nice move. Good stuff. This is a move you want to play sometimes earlier to prevent this move. But hey, you want to play this move no matter what. You know, some point this game, so... We, can, we gotta see h3 at some point. Um, as usual, you're not gonna see me play bishop takes f3 too many times because it you know, gives away for nothing. Um, bishop h5 is almost always gonna be the reaction. If you're gonna go to these two squares, you probably didn't need to put your bishop there in the first place. So I'm gonna go back to h5 and we'll see what he does. So rook b1 looks like a move sort of like out of the corner of my eye. Like my, I'm focused on basically everything here. So when I see a move like rook b1, or if I saw him play a3 or a4, I would classify anything on like these two files as a, as a bad move, <laughs> basically. Because I know that the, the action is all over here. So uh, I'm happy to see this move. It shows me that he's probably thinking about moving the knight because he doesn't want to lose his pawn even though that wouldn't be a concern because his rook would go over there and win my pawn back. So uh, I think I'm going to drop my bishop back out of, uh, out of danger here and, and see what he wants to do. But yeah, I, think, I think bishop back to b6 makes some sense. The other move is to castle, but I'm going to go with this. Knight d5. I mean, hey, moving the center of the board, that threatens to take my bishop. Definitely looks like a good one. Um, I'm going to start by taking it because uh, the knight's doing a lot from the middle there. Now, the same rules apply to Valentinian here. I don't think this move is good. Blocks the bishop, doubles the pawns. I like this decision by him. I'm going to choose to go c, uh, c6 here. Stop, bishop takes pawn, and attack his. He goes back, so I think he's playing very well here. I'm going to choose to castle. And I might be thinking about one of these two moves next. Now, when I see this move, I'm pretty much not going to think twice about doubling those pawns. Always, always, that's why we have the bishop there. We're waiting for this move to happen. He takes there, and immediately, let's get our queen involved. Look at those dark squares. Look at these pawns we're hitting. All right, I said look at the dark squares and look at the pawns. Here they come, pawn and a dark square. If 
very likely a checkmate in two here. He would uh, he would need to play a move that he probably doesn't want to play in order to stop checkmate. And he didn't do it, which means we will get a checkmate here. Very tough to prevent. Not a pattern you may be totally familiar with, but um, very expected with these double pawns. And Valentinian actually lost both games in kind of the same way. So a, a lot of uh, a lot of moments to learn from, in my opinion. But let's let's chat about it with him. Hello, buddy. What's up? Oh, see, Val Valentini sounds like he's on life support after those two games. I'm frustrated. Why I'm are you sorry. frustrated? Well, a few things. One, I'm not used to these positions, so like it's just not as natural for me, and I just play on instincts. So that's one. But two, like the first one, I just you know obviously I just mess up the habits, fell to a stupid tactic, and then I mouse slip, so I made it even worse. And then even this game, like just that pin, so annoying, and just trying to get out of it. I mean, you just like you know. You know, you know, you know, you. What is the right word I'm looking for? You just not abuse that, like mm -hmm. that pin. So like, it's just very frustrating. I don't even know, like I can't even give good building habits because all I'm trying to do is like defend, like, this pin. So like, I can't even get a good plan out because all I'm doing is defending. If that makes sense. It makes <laughs> a lot of sense. Although I think you underestimate um, maybe the the effect that that can have on a lot of people because. They're going to look at it and be like, yeah, I would, I would pretty much do what Val's doing. And then they see what happens. And, well, they're about to maybe get an explanation from, from me and, and so will you about well, how to handle that. watch sort of Building Habits 101. You get it. Boom. They can, but, um, you know, there's two sides. There's one side where, you know, you shouldn't let that happen. But there's also the side where if you look at my position in both games, that's exactly how you can take advantage of your opponents. So... It's a lesson about like what plans to to do for one side and how to stop them from the other side. Because the thing about E4E5s, yeah. is it's so symmetrical that a lot of times when you're thinking about a plan with the white pieces, it's also maybe a plan with the black pieces. Or if you're thinking about doing something with black, white can maybe do it first. So you have to be careful. Um, so that's the thing with these symmetrical positions is they, uh, they mirror each other for obvious reasons. For yeah. Plans as well. well and that was a nice mate at the end, dude. I was like, oh, I can only try and prevent this maybe one way. Because, like, obviously, like, I saw what's happening. So I could sack the queen. But I didn't see that mate. Just queen over, sidestep. <laughs> yep. Yep. There's one other important way to stop it. At least only one other way that I saw. Other than <clears throat> losing the queen. And so I can bring it up. I'll show you it when we get there. Well, I think it was a uh, rook over or something, maybe. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, mean, I, I looked at that one too, but I still thought I could like there was a mate. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not as uh, you got to share your screen, by the way. Oh yeah, I turned it off because uh, you know I figured uh, my arrows might give you a big big help <laughs> during the game. You know, I don't think any help in either of those games would have helped. Man. <laughs> it was so depressing. I was living a so like you're talking about so deaf. There's two games, slow deaths. But that's that's exactly how I want you, and I want you to, like, <laughs> I really want you to echo that and, like, say it out loud so people understand. That's exactly what's going to happen when you get pinned with this bishop g5 or bishop g4 thing. It sounds so basic, but we have to stop allowing that as e4, e5 players, especially around your level, because people keep allowing it, and as soon as you face a guy who knows how to, like, really prosecute that advantage... You're going to be in so much pain, and you're going to experience exactly what you're feeling right now. Yeah, it's it's like that's when I just turn off chess.com and go watch, you know, a game. <laughs> I, don't, I don't keep playing uh, chess. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's that's what we want to prevent. We want to make sure people are on chess.com and buying premium memberships with the chess bra affiliate code. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Link in the description. <laughs> so you castle first move. Um, it won't be surprising to know that I'm going to recommend h6 because that's the move I played when, when we reversed the position. 
Um, but what does HTC right, do? Right, to prevent that. Yeah. Exactly. What does it do? You, you know, not surprising now that you've seen both games, but uh, Bishop G5, so annoying. If this bishop was on E7, it wouldn't be that annoying. But because Black's already committed the bishop here, you know that the rest of the plan is kind of pawn to D6, bishop can develop out somewhere, and castle. So, the plan is simple, boys. Yeah, well, the plan is simple, but the order is important. And here, the order, starting with this move, when you have castling and a center pawn move available, is not the most natural, right? Um, H6 does, does, you know, it's an intentional move. It's not something not you're gonna, just going to randomly think of. My uh, uh, over-the-board tournament scarred me, so when I can castle, I was castling. So. <laughs> and that's fair. You almost always want to castle as soon as possible. This is one of the exceptions that I like to mention, which is how annoying this pin is. Um, so h6 I do like, but let's look at what happened here because it's important to remember that if this happens to you, there's still ways to handle it. And uh, you actually handle things in this game a lot better than the second game in terms of getting out of the pin. So you go like <laughs> this. I knew I went wrong right away after I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't going to let that happen twice. Mistakes. <laughs> yeah, you brought the bishop out in the second game. <laughs> so here you're you're obviously getting hit twice and you decide to go g5 now it might be tempting for me to go like knight takes g5 but i'll even show you the like rather the, the lines if you're if you're curious like knight takes g5 actually not as easy as you might think because you take here and although it seems insane to allow me to have like a, a knight move here if i move my knight back to attack your queen well you move your knight back and actually you just want a piece there kind of crazy yeah, I didn't realize we reversed the games, but yeah, no. Um, so like obviously you just I think you even knew you could do this. Like you take the other knight and take like you take you take my knight, right? And then um Here you mean or later? Like oh yeah, later. Yeah, later. You just move the bishop back and then you take my knight and then you're like you're just extorting my uh the pen, right? And then like I'm all opened up. Or you know, actually okay, sorry. I'm Are just you talking about, about the other game. Confused. Yeah, I was gonna say you're talking about the other game. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Yep, no, but that's correct. We'll save that for the next game, but um, that's why I was saying I think you handled this one better because you didn't let that happen. You didn't let the double pawns happen, and G5, although it looks, you know, kind of sketchy here, is actually a very reasonable move. Very reasonable move. So I go back, and you take, I take um, the bishop move here. Very logical. You're doing to me what I did to you. Um, I would definitely advise maybe move like this as well. Um, but I like it. I like your bishop g4. I'm just pointing out that this move, even from the white pieces in your next game, you don't always need the rook to support it. I know it looks bad, but these double pawns are actually really good sometimes. Controls the right, and then it opens the, di or the, the, yeah, the column for the rook, yeah. 100%. So don't be afraid to play this move and challenge my bishop and get a trade going, especially the pawn takes is often really good for you. So you go right. here. I don't want to let the same thing happen to me, so I stop your knight from getting in. Um, I even said I'm going to reverse his tactics. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't have you doing me dirty on my show here. <laughs> um, you go here, and I love this move because you hung this pawn. I don't know if you know you did, but if you play rook there afterwards, I got to move my bishop again, and then you take my pawn. Um, potentially. Uh, actually, no, I don't think so. Actually, this was like my mouse slip. This is like that night was actually a mouse slip. I was looking at it, but it, I, I didn't fully think of everything. So, like, it just. So, your happened. mouse slip was one of your better moves. Yeah. Usually, well, <laughs> usually that's not how it is. But, yeah. For this example, yes. Because in the next game, I'll even mention it when we get there, but you actually played rook here before. Like, right now, you played rook there to guard right. it in order to move your knight. And I right. much prefer moving the knight first. Because, gotcha, because you, you say you like, hey, yeah, you just say, hey, I don't care. And it's just way better to not even waste time playing that move if you don't have to. Right. Makes sense. So, and hey, I like this move. I think you wanted to get d5. I couldn't tell, but it's what it looked like to me. Yes. Okay. And then this is me just trying to take advantage of, of this because g5 is a move that you, uh, you played at a good time. But in general, generally speaking, you don't want to play that move at all. It's a move you want to stay away from. It's very weakening around your king. And the way the game went this time is how a lot of your games are going to go and when you're playing g5. It's going to get a very, like, the easy attack for your opponent, a very exposed king. It's going to be tough to handle. 
Yeah, so like I know you're not supposed to move pawns in front of the the king. Like obviously that's a general rule of thumb. Mm-hmm. Like, but I don't know why. I just wanted to be like I wanted to go aggro against your. Like I know it's a building habit. So this first thing I said this is like a building habit. It's like set up. You know, like I'm just not an e4 player, so like, I'm just not familiar with like with these. So and yep. I went more aggro trying to just knock your bishop out, so you couldn't do the tactics. And then I realized that I actually allowed you to do the tactics, and I was like, oh shit. Well, they they work maybe in a different way. Uh, I stand by what I said earlier. I still think you played g5 at a really good moment, like a perfect moment. You might not have known that, and maybe you were just gonna go aggro anyway. But you're the way you played g5 to not allow this is better than what you did in the second game where you allowed it. So I still right. think this was a good decision. It's just more of an overall caution that you don't want to put yourself in a position where you have to play g5. You'd rather right. you'd rather play h6 early and not even allow my bishop to get there. So this isn't even a position you're considering. So right. the fact you were in that position, I think your g5 move was good. But it's a reminder that even when you play g5 and it's good, it can still turn bad very quickly. Well, I, yeah, right then I knew you were just going to, like, try and get, like, castled, get your rooks on the H file, like, and right. just, I'm screwed. Like, I already saw it. I, I just don't know how to get out of it. Like, I tried moving the pawn up on F7, realized yep. that was pinned. I'm like, oh, man, it's even worse. Yes, but I really like what you did. So, I mean, you go here, and, and you have an interesting option is that after this, you could try to move your king up. By the way, when you played this, I really like the move. It's a great move to get out of this. So you can finally move your pawn up and it allows you to get your rook over to challenge this. So right. if you had tried something like this, maybe I would have castled like the game, F6. I know it's not pretty, but you're covering like all the pawns really solid here. And then maybe you just like challenge my rook and hey, my bishop is not looking too pretty here. It's like completely stuck in. And I think you, you have very reasonable chances. Did I? I think I did that just too late, or no? Yeah, you sort of did. So this is the game. So you went, you brought the knight in, and you don't have to bring the knight in. It's not a bad move, but you don't need to. You could leave it there and do the same thing. So you wasted maybe one move with that. I got castle. You brought the king up. Again, I thought that was fantastic. And then I played this, and here, I think you should let me take you and just take it back. So move your bishop back, basically. Because by taking me, you brought away a key protector of that knight. And that's where you eventually just lost the game. Because you went here, you. Uh, you moved your bishop, you had to, and I took here, and you're dead. Because if, if you take, I take back, I'm covering all these squares, and rook check is just going to be like checkmate next move. Right. So you're completely dead there. But if this pawn is here, at least, you know, takes, takes. You've got this covered. Queen trade's fine for you. And if I take your knight, you know, you can take with, with either one, and it's a lot different and way safer for your king. <clears throat> Makes sense, yeah. <coughs> I get it. So I really didn't mind the way you played, but I think knight f4 and then taking me, those are the two critical mistakes. If you played king up, I know it's not great, but your f6 move that you were hinting at is actually actually very reasonable here. Man, you make such a like horrible position, feeling like way better than like I don't know. I just felt like dead lost since like move three. <laughs> I know, I know the feeling, but as you get a bit better in chess, you start to tell yourself that hey. If I if I made the engine play my position, so like if you hate <laughs> if you hate your position as black, let's say in, in this position or something, and you're like, oh yeah, I'm just like dead here. If you tell yourself, well, if I played the white side of this position and I made the engine play black, he would find absolutely amazing moves and he'd probably beat me. <laughs> so I sometimes <laughs> give, the, give just say that out loud in my head, like as a reminder, like, oh yeah, there is always the best move in the position, even though it looks bad, and the engine will always find a way to continue the game normally. And if, if it's losing, then it'll be losing like 10, 20 moves down the line. So there's, it's very rare for you to be in a position that's like symmetrical, even material, and just dead loss, like just hopeless. That's so rare. Right. It'll that's never fair. be like that. That's, that's so. an interesting take. Uh, I like it. I do actually like that. So I'm going to bring up our second one here. And there's going to be, there's going to be a few things that are very similar. See, I, you know, I thought I defended the second one again. I thought that I did that one better, even though, like, eventually, like, it crumbled. But I, I thought I was standing uh, a lot more than the, the first game. I think you, you made... I think you were. Like, um, I think it was a lot more resilient. But I think there was one specific move where it just got out of hand, and we'll get there eventually. But having those double pawns. 
those double pawns. Yeah. Those are those are what kill kill you here. So, for example, <laughs> h6. You know why I'm playing that? <laughs> I'm like, you know what? We gotta stop. Make sure Valentinian didn't watch me play the white pieces and say, "Oh, I'm just gonna do it now myself." <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> you, you you know, Big Val was like, "All right, let me get the let me get that notation for the last game. I'm gonna bust it out real quick." <laughs> <laughs> Got him, boys. <laughs> so I had to hit you with the H6 one time. Castling. So you did the same. I'm going to call right. it a mistake for now. It's not a game-ending mistake, but uh, I've, I'm a big fan of this move in general. Now, it's not a mistake, obviously, because I'm not threatening this, but it lets me know that when I do play this move, you might not realize that the bishop is threatening to go there. I, I feel like... I I don't know why, but I, maybe I was an early series of the habits, but I thought you want them to do that so you can play H3 because you're already going to do that eventually, and it's like you're gaining a tempo, and then like it, you're just kicking the bishop back. So but you I guess maybe because a lot of times they would take the knight, and then you could just take with the queen, not actually pulling the uh, bishop back. Yeah, so you're either thinking about really, really early in habits where we were allowing this and it was bad, but we were focused on other things like, hey, just put your damn pieces out. That's already a good thing when you're 400. Um, and then as we improved, we realized, wait, this is like an absolute killer uh, around like 800 to 1000 ELO. And then later on, you know, if your knight isn't developed to this square, but it's actually developed to that square supporting your knight, then you're OK with this pin because, hey, you've got this knight here ready to, to take back like um, 10 times out of 10. So it's, it's more when the knights don't protect each other and the bishop isn't protecting this knight. You have no none of your pieces can support this guy. Um, I don't know if this matters, but Dan just left. All right, never mind. He's back. <laughs> he, <laughs> he he had enough of that explanation. <laughs> like, you know what? I heard this this garbage before. <laughs> well, some people need on repeat, Dan. Sorry. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Including uh, Valentinian, who got absolutely. Rinsed and repeated, sent him for a little, uh, you know, power cycle uh, here with Bishop G4. <laughs> and again, I think we should start with H3, small detail, but I think we should start with H3 um, just first. And rookie one, as I mentioned to you, you don't need that if you want to play Bishop there, right? You should be encouraging or really like trying to goad me into playing Bishop takes Bishop because you should want these double punts. These are good for you. Right. Now, if I pin you, who the hell cares? I can't get a knight in there. You've got this defended like three times. And you've got this pawn guarding the center, helping you play d4, supporting this move, which is great. And you got a nice open file. So you should be stoked if I take you. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why, but like, you don't think double center pawn, like center pawns, are, like, I don't know, like. It's not the first thing. Yeah, yeah, and, like, for example, like, I don't know, you know, this is a completely different game, but, like, I started taking, like, uh, like if, let's say, the bishop did take, it would take with a d7 pawn, or, like, vice versa, I don't know. I, like, if I'm I was over a, here? Like, yeah, so, like, if my bishop was attacking your knight from b to c, right? Oh, like, here. Oh, right, and then, so you would take b to, like, so you would take... Yep. Yeah. But then, like, if your other pawn was on d7, right, you're supposed to take inwards. You mean, like, if this pawn was here, which yeah, one would like, I take with? Yeah, but you would take with the d pawn. In that case, I think it's pretty dependent, but the rule that you should generally follow is, is like, you know, you almost always take towards the middle. And the only time you take away from the middle is if it's some related to being some sort of theory. So I know what you're thinking of in the Rui Lopez, there's a lot of theory where you take with this pawn. So that's okay because because you said like you take that way so it opens up the file for your queen. Mm -hmm. So like that's why I don't know like I started doing it that way and so and then so like going from B to like taking inwards right that's a better way of putting it is uh I don't know it's just like I stopped trying to make that as natural. So, so you, like, should, I don't... you should just all, always always take in your words inwards always take towards the middle, and the the likelihood of you needing to take the other way or the other way being a better choice. Like, for example, taking this way is going to be few and far between. It's going to be like one time out of 10. Gotcha. Uh, so if you had like 100 positions in front of you, and it was like, which way do you capture? And it was a question. Yeah, there would be some where it was like D takes C. And there would be some where it was like E takes F. But like almost all the others would be capture inwards, capture towards the center, for sure. I reprogram it. 
Yeah, it's better to think of it that way. And then, hey, if you happen to make a mistake where you take this way and you should have taken that way, I'd rather you see you make that mistake than if you're always taking this way because you're going to be making more mistakes that way. You're going to be missing all the good moves. For sure. It makes sense. Though. I mean, you want more in the center. And like, yep. you, like you just showed, it just reinforces your, your center. And now three things are protected that night. Mm -hmm. you know, just, it all makes it all clear. Yep. So go with that as your default. And then slowly as you play games, you might realize like, oh, it was actually better to take away from the center or outwards here. And then maybe treat that as an exception and try to remember the exact way that, that the position was when you needed to take outwards and just try to remember that. Because uh, if you try to remember all the positions where you take inwards, you're going to have to memorize thousands. But if you just always take inwards and memorize the ones where you need to take outwards, it's going to be way less stress. There's For much sure. less of yeah. them. So knight d4, similar stuff to last time. And we actually get a, a you know very similar position. I've got the two bishops now. Um, I thought you might consider g4, but you had done it last game and you know, it didn't necessarily work out the best, so you might have stayed away from it, was my thought. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and here's where you played this move that I wasn't a fan of. Um, basically, I wasn't sure when you did this, but did you want to move this knight somewhere? Like, was that your plan? I mean, I was... So, A, your bishop's just annoying, and I'm like, I just want to get it out of the way. So, like, I wanted to just pressure it. So, like, I was looking at e2... Mm -hmm. I was also looking at, um, you know, even going to B5, like, you know, just yep. trying to just attack the bishop. But then I realized, oh, snap, my pawn's hanging. So then I even looked at A4 to protect the pawn. No, 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 sorry, knight A4 oh, to protect yeah. the, the pawn there. So that's not hanging because I'm just trying to hang on to all my stuff. Yep. And I'm like, okay, now I'm probably going to lose that eventually down the road. So let's play defense or like a little more Knight smart. on the side of the board, right? Like your other game. Not yeah, a good so sign. So I was just, all right, I'm just going to play a little more defensive. Mm -hmm. Rook over, then move my knight next one, uh, next one. And now that you've already heard me talk about your first game, you know that I'm going to tell you, hey, it would have been sweet to, to see you like play one of your knight moves first because if I go and grab that, you'll just go here and grab this. Same as right. uh, the other position we were talking about. So I prefer your more aggressive line of thinking where it's like, yeah, if he wants to grab it, hey, I got, I'm taking this pawn as well. It's fine for me. For sure. So it wasn't the best move. It's not like a stone cold blunder or anything, but it's just one of those moves that, hey, anytime you pass a free move to your opponent, for example, my move improves my position probably a little bit more than yours does. So just a little bit of a shift in the, uh, the evaluation there in my favor. See, I thought you were just pulling your bishop back because you thought I was going to forget about something and snipe it later. <laughs> hey, not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. We know those long diagonals get people. <laughs> Um, I got the two bishops here, but here I, I, I'm not even close to thinking that I'm like totally winning. Absolutely not. Um, now that I'm castled, by the way, you could have considered this. And, you know, it's not as dangerous for me to open things up because I got, I got no rook here, right? I'm not, not like I'm checkmating you or anything. So definitely thought you might have considered that. Um, my next moves were going to be king over, followed by maybe f5 and just try to attack this square. And you played them with queen d2, and this is the big mistake in my eyes that you need to you need to know how to play after this because it's not the end of the game, but as you saw, the game ended you know three four moves from now. So in fact, it was the end of the game, but it didn't have to be. What's a much better move than the one you played here? You played that. What should you do instead? <clears throat> Especially because you know after this that I I took your pawn here. So what's a better move for white? <clears throat> I mean, probably just rook over. So what square? Like what move? What square? Well, F, sorry, rook f1 or e to f1. Just protect that pawn. <laughs> and here you're going to have the worst uh, wake up call. I'm going to check you and you can't take me. <laughs> and I'm going to take go. your pawn. I'm going to take your pawn. I'm just going to mop up. I'm just literally mopping the floor with your pawn. You know, rinse and, rinse and repeat, baby. But exactly. uh, all right, so go back. Let me look at it again then. All so right. here I'm actually threatening this pawn for free. And you guarded it with the king, which was not that great, because then you blundered that pawn. Right. So how can you take care of this pawn, but also not blunder that pawn, which you, you are guarding it right now? Um, I mean, the only other thing I can see is getting a bishop over there, dude. But then that's not working. I'm, dude, how, do, how do I defend my h3 pawn? There's a possibility here. I promise you I'm not uh, setting you up for 
an embarrassing moment. For failure. There, there is no, a, yeah. There so it's not that. Oh, I guess you could just go G King G2 instead, because then it protects that uh, pawn on F3, and then also your queen's protecting that, and it's guarding it. Hell yeah, and it also protects every single one of your weak pawns. One, two, and three. So King, See, King G2 is like a hero move. Right, well, and I don't know why, but I was just, you know, queen over to G5, but then, like, we would trade queens. Yep. And, like, I guess it's not the end of the world, but, like, I don't know, I was just... I kind of wanted to survive and keep my pieces on, and, like, I don't know. Like, obviously, I didn't see the variation of the easy checkmate, but, like, I, I noticed that, you know, I could trade queens, and, like, I don't know, I just kind of skipped over it. That's fair. If you're a natural, aggressive player, you're going to want to keep the queens on, but... You do have to be objective at times that, you know, in some positions, hey, the best move is going to be trading the queens off. And if you're resistant to the best moves, <laughs> you're, you're going to get mated in two moves sometimes. <laughs> um, no, for sure. I mean, it's, it, that, I definitely didn't see that during the, like, the thing. I just yeah, was like, fair. okay, like king up h2. And then like, I totally just missed, like, overlooked the easy checkmate of like I, I saw bishop takes so i was like oh that's nothing right i was mm -hmm. like if he takes with the queen then i could just take with the queen and right. like well if i take with the know, queen the funny thing is we trade queens I, I still, well, I would, well i know but i would lose a pawn it wouldn't be there in the world right no so, i know I it's still, just that, either way i'm losing a pawn i thought it was well, just that here you're not losing a pawn and you're somehow upset about the queen trade but when you lose a pawn you're okay with it <laughs> Well, sometimes you just got to, like you, like you say, you gotta be objective at times. But like I, you <laughs> well, know, I, that's not my advice to you, <laughs> right? And I, I, I agree with you. I'm not saying I'm opposed to the queen trades. I'm just saying like I didn't want to at that time because like, you know, I need all the help I can get. My position is crap. But if like I'm forced to take it because you take the you take the my pawn on f two, like what other moves is there, right? So yeah, you if you if you had played king g two, I think you really would have survived longer than you might have expected because. You know, I'm attacking you. I, I'm probably wanting to keep my queen on the board. You're defending, so queen trades are good for you. So I wouldn't really go for this, and instead I'd try to add more pieces, but hey, at least you got things covered. You got rooks that can slide over um, to defend, and, you know, no, we got opposite bishops as well. <laughs> yeah, king g2 would have uh, elongated the game 100%. And here, you mentioned rook over. I think you had to play this one to cover that square. I know it sucks because you're going to lose the rook, but hey, I think it's the only move to stop yourself from getting mated. Well, I don't think that's what I played, is it? Didn't I play, like, Rook F or something? Or well, if you played Queen this, back. then, you, then you getting checkmated in two moves would have been very impressive. Um, you played here, and so... Oh, yeah, yeah, because I was like, okay, maybe I could remove the bishop. Um, but, so I was thinking check, and then I could go king back. I don't know what I was thinking, but... Uh, oh, like bishop check? Well, I used to know it was checkmate. Yeah, I, I thought I could just... Uh, for some reason, I thought I could just take this bishop, and then, like, you don't have anything. Mm -hmm. like I was there's, hoping. unfortunately there's two pawns hanging with check and, and everything like it's, it's kind of all crashing but you lost the only pawn on a dark square and then all your other pawns are light squares so my dark yeah. square bishop is just kind of like running around like it's a playground <laughs> yeah no i mean for sure no that's uh that makes sense you know it's uh it was a lost position in my head like 20 moves before this so, like, uh, <laughs> i know but remember what i told you it never is the engine would always find a way to beat you. Just remember that. Yeah. There's always a best move, especially in a losing position. And that's a really, really hard skill to hone down. Like to actually be able to play best moves in bad positions. That's what creates like a very strong player, a very resilient, good defender. Um, because it's so annoying. Imagine that you are the one who has the winning position. How many times have you messed that winning position up? So many. Right? I, we all do it. It's so hard to win a game that you're winning. You get so frustrated. You're like, damn, he's finding everything. He's finding all these moves. Well, that's good defense. They're finding good moves in bad positions. So it's the classic chess catch-22 where when we have the good positions, our opponents always find the best moves. And when we have the <laughs> bad positions, we always find, well, we just don't find any good moves. <laughs> classic. You got you to gotta get better at <laughs> being more resilient on defense and being more uh, KO on offense. Finding finding the knockout blows. So there you go. You had very similar reasons why you lost both games, actually. And although these must maybe aren't positions that you're gonna get all the time, I think they're very useful for for people to see. Um, I know they weren't positions you're totally familiar with, 
But as you said, you don't know any positions, you know, one opening. So there wasn't much I could do for you there, bud. Yeah. <laughs> but hopefully uh, it's a little more clear, maybe, maybe uh, to you and, and to others. First of all, how to handle these pins. And second of all, if they do, like how to prevent them. And then if you do have them, how to handle them. Um, because they, they shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that easy to just like pin the guy, add the knight in, and then suddenly you win. But it should, the recipe should never be that easy. <laughs> Thanks, pal. Appreciate it, buddy.